Hey everyone, I'm Brad from Calgary. This is Sean from Cambridge, Ontario. I'm Terry from Cornwall, Ontario. Hey, this is Larry from Pitt Meadows, British Columbia. And you're listening to the Towing Life Podcast. Welcome to the Towing Life Podcast, where the ditches are deep, the trucks are loaded, but the drivers are not. I am your host, Towman G, and as usual, I am joined by my co-host, friend, and former co-worker, the one chain wonder himself, Mr. Changes Locations All the Time, Plane Guy. <laughs> How are you doing today? What is going on, G? What is going on? I love the emphasis you put on one chain. Uh, for anyone that knows me, knows that's bullshit um but i'm doing good you're right i am constantly recording from somewhere different as you guys and girls know listening towing is about being on the road being all kinds of places and that is uh, is exactly what's happening and we are making the best we can with the tools that we have in the toolbox that is what today is about before we get into far into today though I want to remind everyone, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, anything like that you want to add to the show, you can find us on Facebook at The Towing Life Podcast. You can email us at thetowinglife at gmail.com, or you can visit the website, www.towinglife.ca. There is a contact us form there. All the information you need to find to get a hold of us is all there. You will also see it if you're watching on YouTube at the bottom of the screen. G is great, puts it there every week. 100%. We can also take a chance to shout out our logos. As you guys see, we don't have any on the video side today, but I wanted to take a th- take a moment to thank all of our sponsors up to date that we've had for the show, all of our supporters. You guys have been phenomenal. We have Strong Arm Recovery, Herbs Towing, Baker Heavy Towing, Cornwall Towing, and Project PCs. Anyone looking to get involved with the show and become a supporter, you can find that as well on the website, towinglife.ca. There is a Become a Supporter tab there. Feel free to check it out. Not to mention, we also have our poll going on. G. that poll will end today. Uh, The poll is completely anonymous for those that are worried. I have had a couple people reach out and go, ooh, I don't want to vote because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I can assure you, we have no idea where the votes are coming from. We get, you know, the notification of a vote. That is it. Uh, I wish we knew where they were coming from because I would be mighty insulted by all the people who have voted for me to take a week off of the show. (laughs) Um, But that's not the case. So I appreciate you guys checking it out. You can visit that at towinglife.ca forward slash poll. You will find the opportunity there to vote. If you don't know about it, it is... Uh, one of us is going to take a week off of the show. Uh, by take a week off, I mean G's still going to have to do the editing and everything, regardless of what happens. Uh, myself, I might uh, just end up working another day is probably what will come of it. But uh, fun no less. We want to hear from you guys. We want to see who you want to have take a week off, who you want to keep on the show. And uh, yeah, so visit the website. Check it all out. Drop us a link. Drop us some comments. We will get to a question today that was sent via the messenger on the Facebook page as well. Uh, I don't know if, G, you wrote the name down. I forgot to. Yeah, you forgot to write the name down, and I just remembered what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> we are a pro- Together, we are fine. Alone, we are incompetent. Yeah, if, uh, if playing guy here, point the right way has to take the week off you know the intro will be a lot shorter because rambling you know (laughs) um but getting right into it uh the question that we had sent in on facebook i do apologize for not remembering your name i wasn't the actual person that took your message uh besides the point his question was uh the uh medium duty towing right uh he just wanted to know more about medium duty towing and so there, there's a couple of different things that I personally think about when I think about medium duty towing. And that is what is medium duty towing? And now for smaller companies that mostly do light duty towing, medium duty towing is anything over 6,000 pounds, right? Six to 10,000 pounds. For the heavy guys out there, medium duty is normally like 10 to 20,000 pounds, right? 
And then Ooh, I don't know if twenty thousand pound counts as mid duty. I don't know what heavy company is saying twenty thousand. No, but I mean like for their size of trucks. Like you've got your large medium duty trucks, and then you got your small medium duty trucks that are like a two ton truck or like a fifty five hundred, right? I'm assuming like a twenty five ton wrecker could also be classified as a medium duty truck just because now we go all the way up to like 80,000 pound wreckers, right? Yeah, so that's fair. where is that, where's the line? Uh, as for wreckers, I'm not sure too much what to tell you. I can tell you as for retail and for rates and everything involved, we consider medium duty anything over a 1500 pickup truck. The moment you get into the 25, 35s, 45s, and 5500s um for the most part that is all the mid-duty range uh so you know as soon as soon as you had start throwing diesels at them too right they get a little bit heavier but your your f-250 four-door diesel it's a mid-duty your you know your 3500 of course is automatically a mid-duty uh 450s and 550s i think depending on what you know you don't see too many 450 or 550s with boxes on the back right you see them with tool you know there's some sort of um, equipment on the back, right? Meaning uh, box trucks, different things like that. You don't see too many of them with a pickup bed on the back. So those can fall depending on what they are loaded, unloaded. You start to fall into that mid medium to heavy duty range. Okay. I'm personally a big fan of mid duty towing. Um, I find it's a nice mix between that light and heavy, right? You're not doing the Volkswagen Jettas, aren't your mid duty? You're you're getting more of those, you know. I'll be the, I did it yesterday. I did a school bus, a 3,500, one of those GMC 20 passengers, 28 passengers, whatever they are, school bus, uh, which is a nice change. It's not quite, you're not hauling tractors down the highway, but you're still getting that fork. Uh, you know, you're still forking a lot of that stuff. Some of it is still wheel grids with these mid duty wreckers having the, the heavier wheel grids or uh, spoons. So it's a nice, it's a nice kind of mix in my opinion, because this big boy don't fit between tandems very well. <laughs> to be dropping drive shafts it's uh it's a cold day when i'm already underneath dropping one on the school bus like i was doing yesterday 100 percent. now <laughs> another thing we have different rates we do roadside rates for medium and heavy we have a heavy rate through uh some roadsides that starts at ten thousand pounds which is still medium duty ish right so your c-class <laughs> rbs and some of your uh tow behind trailers those get all thrown underneath the heavy rates and what I really want to talk about is how that hinders or helps operators and the actual owners of said company. Now, why I think it might hinder the operators themselves. So let's say you got six trucks in a fleet and you've got one truck that's capable of doing that kind of work. I'm sure a lot of the other drivers will get upset because they don't get to make any of the big money calls right so then they'll always be pushing the owner to get bigger or at least the same equivalent type of truck right so i can see where that starts to start a pissing match or bickering contest between operators especially if all those operators are trained and are capable of doing said work they just don't have the equipment to do it so well, that's the, that's the key point is if the operators are trained, right? You can have, you know, you can have the truck to do the mid duty work. And, and I know a lot of operators that have no interest in it, mm -hmm. right? They're either light or they're heavy. That in between the heavy guys are more likely to want to do the mid duty than the light guys are willing <laughs> to do the mid duty, right? There's only a couple light operators that'll be trained on the mid duty. So you're right. You are right though. You know, if you have those willing and ambitious employees, and based on your system, whether you're commission based, right? We do know that with the commission based system that, you know, is most of Ontario, obviously, yes, the higher paying the job, the higher paid the operator. Yeah. And so bringing that in, you need, you know, that's where your operators will really push for more trucks to be able to make themselves more money. And with your medium to the 10,000 pound mark, normally you switch over to an hourly rate which that could be anywhere from 150 to i've seen 450 dollars an hour which is really high but some people charge that so you you do a 200 300 kilometer tow if you're getting paid round trip that's that could equal out to some guy's whole paycheck in one call right, right. so 
that's when it really starts to be okay well that one operator's doing really good this week he's had a couple of heavy calls but now he gets bumped into a higher tax bracket and he gets fucked that week right so it's almost that's like true. it's almost like if you can share it or like you said if you had enough trucks to share the calls around mm -hmm. it might almost be better but yeah no no it's true it's true it, and and that's up to every every owner and every manager to kind of find that happy balance right again you know a company that, that i work with we have heavies we have lights there's only uh, i believe two light operators that are fairly trained on on doing the mid-duty work um so when one of them takes the day off what do you do or if two of them have the day off what do you do you obviously we have the ability to pull down a heavy to go do it yeah. you know to at least have the training anyone looking at getting into mid-duty training you know or or wanting to tow mid-duty what advice would you give them compared to doing lights right mid-duty is kind of the natural progression from light duties up to heavy duties so any advice you can give for them G? um so <laughs> i've seen a couple of operators that jump right from light to medium duty and they still cut corners right the corners that you cut throw in one chain throw in no safety chain staying in town on your honda civic still illegal but people do it once you get into those heavier weights if something happens and that thing becomes detached, you're not just paying for a car. Now you're worried about 10,000 pounds coming off the back of your truck. So don't cut corners, make sure that it's chained down, make sure it's secured and take your time. Make sure you have a tape measure in your truck because especially with some of these tall box trucks, you're getting close to that 13 six, right? You're, you're getting close to that limit. And it's not something to play around with because you don't want to be taking out a hydro wire. Those are some of the simplest things to just show that, hey, I want to learn and I these are the things that I can do right now. And if you've got someone in your company that is competent in doing that, stick by them. Say, hey, if it's a slow day and you get one, can I come with you? And you can show me how to frame fork or you can show me how to drop a drive shaft or is there any tips or tricks right and then get that hands-on experience let's talk about drive shafts what's your least favorite drive shaft to remove and we're talking mid-duty i know the heavy guys that are listening you're going to be sitting there you guys don't have it hard wait till you get to these pushers and everything else that you know I, i'm i'm talking the big three that we see in the mid-duty side of things we see the fords the gms and the dodges where are you leaning? Have you have you done all three? Uh, I yes, I have done all three. Um, to be honest with you, it doesn't bother me what brand it is. I'm still getting underneath there. I'm still going to get wet. The older they are, the more rusted they are. To be honest with you, the Fords with the twelve points, mm, those are some of my least favorite because then you need specialty tools or you need to have. That one ratchet, or not ratchet, uh, wrench, and if that wrench goes missing, you're pretty well shit out of luck, right? And especially in my company where we share trucks all the time, it's uh, you got to make sure that you've got all your tools in your toolbox before you go out to a job, before you make yourself look like an idiot. Yeah, I can tell you myself, those 12 point, uh, 12 mil, I believe it is on the Fords, I don't mind them. Once you get the socket, the wrench for it there's no stripping right you're not going to strip those things in any way shape or form you get the dodges the ford and the dodge the reason i'm a big fan of them is they're actually a plate bolted on yeah. to the rear to the rear diff right to the output i guess it'd be the input um and they're nice because i hate gms first of all gms this this 11 mil this fucking getting in there you can't get on it straight normally i did one yesterday Thank God it was easy. I grabbed the toolbox out of the truck that the driver had in there. I go to grab a ratchet. I got looking for my 3 8 ratchet. 3 8 ratchet is busted. Hmm. I go, that's perfect. I grab a quarter inch ratchet. I'm like, oh, I hope these things aren't tight. <laughs> because <laughs> we're about to bust the quarter inch if this isn't going to go. And lucky for me, they came right out. It was no problem. But the thing I hate with the GMs is that you've got to take the bolts out. You know, you've got the four bolts to come with you. You've got the... I'm not going to, I don't know what the term actually is for it, but the cups that go over the U-joints, the actual yeah, brackets. The end caps. Not the end caps. Those are a whole different story. I mean the actual, uh, like, U-bolt that kind of yeah. holds the drive shaft yeah. on that you're unbolting. 
yeah. are holes that you join on. Then you've got the end caps. That is something I see a lot of guys that will pull them off, keep the needles on place, place them in the casualty. I am a big fan. I keep a roll of electrical tape with me. When I remove the drive shaft, I wrap the end caps all the way around. And that way the end caps actually stay on there the whole time. You don't have to worry about needle bearings going anywhere. Um, but they are a bit of a pain to get off. I prefer those Fords and those Dodges with the flat plate. You take the four bolts off, you get a pry bar, or a, a flathead in there. You give it a couple wax, a couple to loosen it up, and then it pops right off. Yep. You tie it up, Bob's your uncle, you're going down the road, right? Those GMs, I've never had good luck with them. I hate them. I will take a Ford and a Dodge, the 12 mil, 12 point, and I believe the, the five eights, I think the Dodge is. It's a big enough bolt on it. They're nice and easy to get to. There's no loose parts. There's four bolts to put in the cup holder and away you go. Preferably I'm grabbing them all from the ass and I'm not worrying about that. But you know, these, these school buses, these new school buses they're coming out with these little ones, they run the exhaust right down the frame. Like it literally runs underneath the frame right out oh. the back bumper. And so you can't get the forks on the frame. There is the cross member there. If you got the extensions and the risers and you want to give it a shot, I haven't had the best of luck. It's normally just easier. Screw it. We're taking the shaft off. I don't know who designed that exhaust like that, but I'd like to have a, a conversation with them in a dark alley somewhere. <laughs> and uh, that's the other thing. Like we've got a independent 10 ton wrecker. So an independent boom and wheel lift. And yep. that thing's rated to tow 20,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. Right. You can put 20,000 pounds behind the truck for what the wrecker's rated for, but you don't have the height. Where if you go a Z boom, you, you gain that height advantage so you can pick rear pick more, right? Mm, mm, yeah. So yeah. you can use a smaller set of forks and then you're not double picking. I'm not sure if you've ever had to double pick with forks mm. before where you pick it up and put blocks of wood under the tires. Yeah. I had to do that with a Hino the one day and that was fine. But hey, at least I didn't have to drop the shaft, right? I'd rather just put a couple blocks of wood underneath something and call her a day than drop the shaft, especially on something that runs. Right. Yeah. At least you have the option with uh, a Z boom, but yeah. then you're running into if you're still running the pickup truck chassis, what your what's your rear axle rated for? How heavy is your front end going to be? Like oh. most Z booms, you're looking at a twelve ton, so oh. you're you're getting into those higher weights and lower towing capacities, which kind of sucks. So it's yeah, and the thing is, we run into especially on the mid duty towing. You don't, you know, the one thing you learn about forking on a mid duty is that you rarely. I haven't really ran into it where you can grab a rear axle because of overhang. Yeah. All right. Once you get into the heavy side, of course, there's all kinds of options. You're towing a tractor backwards. There's the U bolts that are right there on the back axle. You can't grab the axle itself. When it comes to the mid duty, you're never, you know, I'm not saying never, but I haven't ran into too many scenarios where you would even consider forking off the rear axle. You're going off of the frame. So, like you said, it's tucked up a little higher sometimes. You got to get the extensions, you got to get the risers, you got, you know, your tall forks out depending what you need to get at it, where, you know, the heavies have that advantage where a lot of things, although they have a lot, you know, they deal with a lot more uh, interesting situations and, and ways to remove stuff. Um, but the stuff is right there. They can grab the U-bolts at the back. They can, you know, away they go. Mid-duty guys, you're grabbing the frame. Key things to look out for, obviously, if you're towing anything off the frame, some of these little buses or these box trucks on the frame itself will have about a welded three-foot extension off the back with these box trucks. For the love of God, never grab it on that extension, right? <laughs> Always grab it ahead of that extension. If you can't reach it, grab it from the front, take the shaft off. It's going to save you some trouble down the line, right? Always, always double check what you were hooking on to. We don't want you to end up, I don't know if you've seen the last week that the Toronto City guy towing a bus. I don't know what the situations were on it, what failed, what let go, what kind of securement was being used, but he lost the bus off the back of his truck and it goes right into a ditch and took out a fence. Yeah. That was a full size uh, city bus, one of those single axle long city buses. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want you to be that guy, right? <laughs> no. and like you said, not that it's any better to lose a car going down the road, right? There's obviously risks and everything involved, uh, but the bigger the weight, the bigger the collateral damage will be if something lets go. So keep that in mind when hooking up, and always double check. Hundred percent, and 100%. yeah, just be careful out there. <laughs> Use your head, <laughs> take your time, figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're coming into the season now where the white gold is starting to fall. And yep. this is one of my favorite seasons because we get to go ditch banging and pulling people ditch out. Banging. 
ditch banging. Yeah, because you're just banging out the calls one after another after another. And people really start to open their eyes a little bit and like, wow, you got me out quick. You, you had a pretty good response time and people start to appreciate the tow truck driver a little bit more in the winter, especially if their car doesn't start and it's a nice cold day. So what do you guys do to prepare for the wintry season? I know, I know some guys who carry two battery packs because you know that day you do like 20 boosts that day and your battery pack dies and now you're down to a set of cables and it sucks. It takes more time and more effort and you get All snow everywhere. Yep. Yep. And uh, I know some guys who run, uh, had a set of tire chains in their toolbox, even if they were too far south to technically be able to run them or even the studded tires if you get up north you're allowed to run those which sometimes i wish i was able to have but uh, at the end of the day i pay less in taxes i hope for it <laughs> <laughs> so for me personally i if i'm sharing this truck with other people like i normally do i always try to bring an extra pair of pants and an extra jacket to keep myself warm and safe because if I start to get cold, then I start to get miserable, and then I try to pick up the pace even more. And then once you start picking up the pace, you might not work as safely as what you could do um, by slowing down and taking a second look at things. And I personally think that's one of the big things is personal safety. You've got snow plows on the road. You've got salt and slush, everything, and people aren't paying attention or people can stop and slide. And it's, you, you got to take care of yourself first. I agree. I think during the wintertime, once the snow falls, right, people, we always have the bad drivers, even in the summertime. In the summertime, they're going to whiz by you at 120. Uh, the wintertime, it might only be 100 if there's snow on the road, but there's more, you know, there's more people sliding all over the place. There's less traction. There's, you know, reaction times are, you know, reaction times are the same, but the way the car handles, most people don't know how to handle a skid. Uh, it just opens us up to a lot more liability for sure. I know myself, winter time is very much like a rainy day. A couple pairs of gloves on rotation, two pairs drying on the floor of the passenger side with the heat cranked, you know, fresh pair, hopefully on your hands and you keep them, you, you grab the driest pair every time. It's not going to be ideal, but one will be drier than the other two. <laughs> um, I was never a big fan of a winter jacket, especially doing light duty towing. Um, the reason for that is if I'm out of the truck long enough to get cold, I'm taking too long. I'm a big fan of layers. I wear long johns, you know, long john t-shirt, work shirt, hoodie, long johns on the bottom, work pants, snow boots, maybe, but I'm not one that can be bothered to pull up on scene, untie my boots, put on my winter boots, jump into the ditch, come out, put on my summer boot or, you know, my, my steel toe boots and back into the truck. Uh, I know a lot of guys like it. I hate also being bulky. The problem we run into, man, worst part of winter is the customers, right? I know this year with COVID, everything is still, you know, depending on where you are, it hasn't really changed much. Um, but customers, the thing is, is they were always cold when they get in the truck and they would want the heat. The mm. problem is, is you were dressed and insulated for the cold. And then, so I was one that would always run with my window, window down in the wintertime because I would overheat if I didn't. Mm-hmm. I always hated that. So you had to dress for the kind of conditions, but then you get in the truck and you're sweating because, you know, they got the heat crank too. old lady is cold. Yeah, they, they turn the heat on before you even got back into the truck. So you normally get into the truck that's a little mellow. So then if you are cold, you can just put your window up and carry on. But no, she's got the heat cranked and you probably left your window up for whatever reason. And it's just yeah. bad news all the way around. The other thing I don't like about customers in the winter you got a flat tire on the side of the road and they ask you if you can please hurry because it's cold outside. Bitch, your car runs. Just doesn't drive at this moment in time. Leave it running with the heat on. Yeah, roadside setting those calls over that, you know, please hurry. Uh, extreme weather. Yeah. You know, normally for cold weather. If it's snow and, and limited visibility, that's a whole other problem. Yeah. But you're right. They'll send that because it's cold outside. And you're like, your alternator didn't die. You got a flat tire. You are sitting in a warm, comfy car. Hopefully, if you're on a major highway or on a roadside, you have your seatbelt on. Best practice to do while you're waiting for us. Yep. But, yeah, you're sitting there comfortably. Like, what is? I, I get every call is a priority, but at the same time, where do we draw the line? And it's also funny where we've both worked out in rural areas, I, I will want to say, and you'll see the people 
in those calls saying they're in the middle of nowhere please hurry you're not in the middle of nowhere you're normally within 20 minutes of any decent sized town but you get the people from the city that that is nowhere to yeah. them yeah, we're not talking about 100 kilometers, 60 miles away from the nearest town. We are talking 15 minutes either way, and you're you're bound to bump into a decent sized city. Yeah, yeah, no, it, <laughs> no, it is true. It's the city. The city folk come up in the summertime, and they go down the back roads they shouldn't, and get stuck, and they rhubarb it in the winter time because they're not used to driving on roads that haven't been perfect. Per yeah, perfectly salted plow the wait two days after a storm Ooh, i don't think it's safe to drive oh come on get out on the highway <laughs> put your put your i'm not i'm not a major advocate for winter tires but at the same time you know i've years went years and years without them they definitely make a difference they oh, do they not do. help you stopping they definitely help you accelerating and turning they do not help you stopping so don't take that uh you know it's like people with the all-wheel drive now everybody's got an all-wheel drive everyone thinks they can do 120 in a snowstorm because i have all-wheel drive <laughs> yeah you're it just means you're going in the ditch faster is all it means when you do lose it it's like uh people who have four by four trucks and they click their truck into four by four to be able to get places better that's fine but your braking hasn't improved at all yeah yeah, yeah. your your four by four has not improved your braking one bit uh, no other tips, you know, again, you keep the extra clothes. That's a great idea. An extra pair of pants, some socks sometimes isn't a bad idea. Same Again, this is all the same as a rainy day, right? It's a rainy day bag. Um, I got, all, <laughs> I got a know, story you, from the other day. I, okay. uh, it was a nice wind shout. And it was that day that it snowed and it was a sidewalk plow. I was like, okay, whatever. And I get there and it's, there's a ditch and it fell off the far side of the sidewalk. And I was like, okay, so... I was dumb. I got there. I got on the side of the road. I I did off both my winches because I have a twin line. And I said to the town guy, I was like, hey, I'm just going to put a winch to the back and a winch to the front, boom up a bit, and slide it back onto the sidewalk all in one go. Nice, quick, and easy. And Fair since enough. I'm standing on the roadside and they're down at the machine, which is probably about five foot drop from where I am. They're like, oh, there's a massive lip here. You can't do that. And I fucking listened to them. So against I turned your better judgment against my better judgment. I listened to them. So I turned the truck around. I pull my winch line out. They wanted me to pull it out frontwards on like a 45 degree angle. It's one of these little uh, articulated things tired versions like they're just absolutely junk so anyways i start running my line i was like the nah, the ditch is about four feet wide and i was like i could probably jump that and as i got down to the edge of the ditch i went to go jump and the ground gave out underneath me and now i'm down knee deep in fucking ice cold muddy water walking across <laughs> through this four foot ditch the town guy gives me a hand and I damn near pull him in too because I'm coming through with my J hook and my winch cable and he damn near goes our silver tea kettle. It was a good time. So I go and I put a single line on the front of this fucking thing and I say, well, I'm going to take the walk of shame back around. They're like, oh, you don't want to cross back through the ditch? I was like, fuck no. <laughs> I was like, I'm wet already, but nah, no. So I start pulling and do you think this thing would come up? No, sir. She slid forward and forward, but she would not come back up onto the sidewalk. I had the guy in there trying to wiggle it back and forth, back and forth, and it would not pop up. So then they're like, oh, grab a hold of the back and pull it sideways. It was like, oh, like what you I mean wanted You mean my original to... plan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at this time, now I've only got one line across, and I sure hell ain't crossing through that ditch again to give him another line. So now I'm trying to do it with one goddamn line. So I try to pull the back end over and the back end still doesn't want to come. Whenever the back end comes, the front end slips back down. And it's just a shitty time all around. But at this point, I've pulled it far enough ahead to where I can back in through off this one parking lot to run a line straight to it. And the sidewalk does a little S bend towards where I need to go. So now I've pulled out 130 feet worth of cable. I've been there for about 35 minutes. I am soaking wet below the knees. And the other two town guys just buggered off. 
So I pulled this thing about the 20 feet it needed to go to get it out finally. Tell him to carry on, and now I'm left to freeze my ass off in this parking lot, wrapping up 110 feet of cable by myself. I that proceeded a lot of operator error. I proceeded to go back to the shop and get two IGA bags or plastic shopping bags and take my socks off and put those on over top of my feet just to try to keep my feet somewhat dry from my soaking wet boots and carried on for the rest of the day. <laughs> that's, that's the other trick I have, boots, wintertime boots. I'm a big fan. If you see me in September, October, you may see some of the most raggedy boots you will ever see on an operator. I will not. I get my boots. Like, I just picked up a new pair last week. I always get my boots right before the snowfall. Give me the yeah. freshest, driest pair. Because yeah. we know we go through boots. Yeah. That's a common problem. We're always going through them. I would rather have a fresh pair for the wintertime. <laughs> not that it's always going to save it. There's only so much water and snow and slush that they will keep out. Eventually, it's all it's going to come through. Yeah. But definitely give yourself the... Uh, yeah, no one likes crawling through. Like, no one... I. This is that time of year. I, I don't mind it when the ground freezes. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Because the ground is hard. There is no mud. And then it's from then until when it's it's snow. And you can just, you know, you get out of that truck and you can, you know, even if it's waist high in snow, you can just walk it. And, you know, it doesn't stick to you. You brush it off when you're done. Yeah. You're um, damp, but it dries nice and quick. You're not soaked to the bone. Exactly. It's not fully saturated into your clothing or your work gear and all that. I would much yeah. rather work while it's snowing than it's raining. Oh, 100%. I've yeah. always said that. I would take the rain over or the snow over the rain every day of the week because it brushes off for the most part. And people just are dumbfounded by that. Yeah. I, I tell them that in the summertime. I was like, <laughs> I'd much rather work while it's snowing like a bastard out than work in the rain. They're like, really? It's like, yeah, you can just brush the snow off and carry on. The rain, you you get wet, and you're wet for the whole day pretty well. Yeah. I always, uh, I've always been a big fan. I would say I'd rather work in the winter than the summer, and people, again, same thing. Oh, because of the, it's more fun? No. Uh, I'm a big guy. Mm -hmm. I am well insulated. In the wintertime, I can dress for the weather. In the summertime, I can only strip down so far before the customer complaints start rolling in. <laughs> so for me, wintertime is the place to be um, because, yeah, summertime, once you get down to that T-shirt and, you know, I'm not a big believer in shorts. I always wear pants in the summertime for cutting legs and everything else uh, for safety. So, yeah, no, I'd much rather the wintertime where I can dress for the weather, where the summertime, you know, unless I'm shedding a lot of this insulation for summertime, it's going to be <laughs> hot. When it's hot, I'm hot. Hot and cranky. I'm the same hot way. <laughs> But is there any extra tools that you don't normally carry on your truck that you do in the winter? I know for I've myself, if, I, if I've got wheel chocks in my truck, I will change those out for a set of spades or anything with some grab on the bottom quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the only thing I change because I, I know for myself, I am always equipped to do recoveries all year long. Yeah. It's, I'm not putting extra equipment on my truck because I don't have extra room to put extra equipment on my truck. Right. I, uh, I've never ran tire chains. We both worked with a guy that did. Yeah. Those tire chains have come in handy to save my ass multiple times. <laughs> uh, going down places I shouldn't, right? The famous call into dispatch. Dispatch, is there any other trucks clear in the area? Yeah, why? Because I'm about to do something stupid. <laughs> and I want to make sure that there's somebody to come get me out when I do it. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the tire chains are definitely something I've never done it. Uh, I've never kept them on the truck, but there's something that's handy. Like I said, you mentioned the two booster packs. Uh, same thing. Change the wheel chocks out for some, uh, uh, what do you call those? Uh, they go behind the wheel. Scotch blocks. Change. Yeah, scotch blocks. Yeah. Swap them out for that. You don't really need those in the summertime unless you're getting into some spots. So make sure they're good. I know we are. We haven't slowed down. I don't know about you guys what's going on, but this is normally the time where it slows down for a couple of weeks until the snow flies. I don't know if you have snow on the ground. Uh, where I am right now, there is no snow on the ground. Where I came from yesterday, I we were getting snow as I left. I don't think any of it stuck. If it did, it stuck for today because it's cold. It'll be gone by tomorrow morning. We've had snow but, for the last five days now, I think. Hang okay, around. Okay, so you guys are getting, yeah, you guys are, you guys are already into full winter mode. We are still in the mad dash leading up to it, where, again, you normally quiet down so you can get all these trucks stocked. We haven't had a chance to stop to be able to do it. So we've been slowly working away at it. It's definitely a grind, but yeah, no, uh, you know, bring some extra gear with you. 
have a go bag in the back seat, fresh socks, you know, fresh gloves, fresh shirt, fresh jacket, all that kind of stuff. Keep it warm. Keep the vents blowing. Trick in the winter. Never put your gloves up on the dash. If I see an operator throwing his gloves up on the dash, I'm going to slap him. I will admit I used to do it. And then I was told better throw them on the passenger floor with the heat crank to the floor. Uh, it'll also, you know, it'll big time help you out. Make sure that washer fluid is switched over. You know, you weren't, if you were running the summer stuff, <laughs> the nights are getting that colder. Mistake before. <laughs> yeah. Plug in the trucks where possible. I know a lot of you listening are coming from the state side. I don't know, depending on where you're listening, you know, you're not running into these winter situations where, you know, you don't know what a, a, a block heater is on a truck. Um, but if you are in an area that needs it, start thinking about plugging them in. The worst thing is to go to start a truck in the morning, especially the bigger ones. And it won't start because the bat, you know, it's frozen right up. Even if you are in the central states and you do run summer windshield washer fluid, put some all season, put something that can get into the negatives. Because if you get a tow going north into the states, you don't know what the temperature is going to be like. Right? That's fair. That's fair. That's it's fair. just smart to do. Yeah. I, I've we, been screwed over by it before and it almost cost me my life and my truck and the trailer I was towing up time. And it's just when you can't see, you can't drive. I know a trucking company I used to work for used to send trucks down to Texas. And that was a big problem we had is they would fuel up down there. They'd get up into the northern up here and the fuel would start to gel up if we didn't put the conditioner in it because they don't run the the condition for the cool weather, right? For the cold. Yeah. They don't no. have the problem down there. So that was a big problem that we had. We always made sure our drivers going down. You know, I can't remember where the line we drew was in one of the Coy Carolinas kind of thing to, you know, if you fuel up south of there, put the conditioner in. Put it in anyways, hell. Uh, because, yeah, the fuel is a big difference too. And, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Keep that washer fluid with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we've got one more thing to touch on today, and it's a little controversial. There has been well, it's not controversial. It's, it is what it is. It's just stupid. Yes. And a continuing problem. But go ahead. Uh, we've had three shootings involving tow trucks in the GTA in the last 24 hours. Not from the 24 hours that you're watching this, but the 24 hours since we've recorded this. Yeah. So go back to last week. Check out the news. If you don't yeah. know, we'll have a link posted. Three shootings in less than 24 hours. One of them might have been domestic. I, I don't know. But three shootings involving tow trucks and tow truck operators within 24 hours within i want to say 150 kilometer circle of each other what the fuck is going on yep. for the last couple of months it's quieted down a little bit the truck fires have kind of subsided a bit or at least they haven't been put in the news as much no they moved east of the border quebec's got a war going on too and trucks are burning uh, okay, so it's not just the us. arsonist went east for the winter, <laughs> but stop it, just stop it. Now I, I know I'm not a guy running the highway all the uh, all the time, nor do I want to be, especially with some of the shit that I'm seeing. It's not worth it in my eyes. Yeah, I'd make a lot more money, but nah, my life's already on the risk enough of getting run over by a Mack truck. I don't need a stray bullet to hit me in the head as well. <laughs> I, I don't get enough hazard pay for that kind of shit, my friend. <laughs> but why are we doing this? If you've got a problem with some guy, you've got two fists. Figure it out in a parking lot. That's how well, it's that's always the... been. Always yeah, so it's it's a weird situation, right? And I know you had mentioned when we were talking about it private or privately about the pilot project, and I thought it was supposed to solve these kinds of problems. I'm not sure when the pilot project was actually coming to an effect. And I think the unfortunately, for a small period of time, that pilot project that they launched in the GTA that makes kind of sections of the highway exclusive to companies is going to agitate these kind of incidents a little more. And the reason is is because now all these guys are fighting for a smaller piece of the pie, yeah. right? Back on the highway when they had all that freedom, they were still fighting and there was still shootings and there was still arson and there was still all kinds of stuff going on, but they had a bigger piece of the pie they were fighting for. Now it's really get it or starve. Yeah, they right? condensed the issue. So now they instead took it of off spreading the highway, out. They took it to the side streets and really starved out some of the work. That would be, that's my assumption. I'm not in the area either. I don't know. You know, I've never been one of those guys running those calls on the side of the highway up there. 
but that would be my prediction is that, you know, it's going to take a second to settle itself out. Obviously it's another black eye on the industry. One that we do not need, right. We keep pushing, you know, the OPP are bringing out a new pilot, you know, their new project in Ontario starting on January one, the pilot project for the 400 highways in, in Toronto, I believe is already taking effect. If not, it's soon, it might be December 1st. So tomorrow when this episode comes out, but I think you're going to continue to see that a little bit while they fight for, you know, it becomes a little more important to get those calls now. I don't know what the solution is to it. They, you know, regulation can only change so much and can only elevate the industry so much. It's, uh, you know, they've left it a long time for us to handle ourselves. We failed at doing that. I think the problem you're seeing though is, you know, it's still isolated enough incidents. It's because we're used to hearing it so much, but, it's because it's in the news so much. You know, I always, I've always said that with the news. Is it that these incidents are happening more than they did back in the day? Or is it just because we have access to the information now? Were they happening just as much back in the 60s, 70s, 80s? Guys that were running up there, you know, let us know. Was it, you know, you hear stories back then. They might not have been shooting each other. They were beating the snot out of each other on the side of the highway. And you're right, you know, what was the good old-fashioned way of settling things? Why do you have to bring a gun to it? No. Uh, but I, I think you're going to see this for a little bit while everything kind of works itself out, the new systems come into place, and then hopefully we can move past it and start making the industry better as a whole. Unfortunately, the only thing that comes from situations like this is more regulations that chokes up the industry more. Mm-hmm. It'll oh, make yeah. it harder for us to find drivers because if they bring out training, mandatory training, who's paying for it? Yeah, but mandatory it? training. I'm Bring for mandatory, mandatory training. training won't stop to somebody from shooting somebody. Yes, but if you've got to do <laughs> mandatory training with like a test as well, you'll probably have to have a background check done beforehand because if you're driving a tow truck, you're going to deal with vulnerable people. So everyone in this industry should at least be able to pass a like a tier three background check for vulnerable people. Here's a question. What percentage of people do you think in the towing industry, active in the towing industry in Ontario? And I'd like to see if we can find this stat somewhere. I doubt we'll be able to. Towing stats are hard to come by uh, <laughs> in Canada. But, you know, what What percentage of operators do you think could actually pass a criminal record check? I'm going to say it's it's a minority. As a, and in the grand scheme of things across the entire province and, and all these operators in, in these bigger cities, I'm going to say it's less than half of, or more than half of them cannot so over 50% cannot pass or do not have a clean criminal background. We had a guy come through our doors. Um, he passed his roadside background check, but to get onto the police contract that we had, he did not pass because his uncle was charged with something 35 years ago. It must have been serious enough because we had an operator, you know, as well as I do, that came in and had a, a previous record. Yeah. And he had to sit down directly with the cops and the company vouched for him and everything. And the company was in good standings and he got cleared no issue. Yeah. And now I think a lot of it comes down to what the charges, charges were. were. Yeah, exactly. But the right. police won't give you that information. So then you've no. got to do your own figure and right. why you got fucked. Right. <laughs> because theft and all that I can see being important, especially if you're doing police impound. That's obviously yeah. something they don't want. Um, I want to say our operator was maybe, and I'm not hundred percent sure. And obviously we're not going to name them anyways, but I think it was some sort of violent, like assault, yeah. um, a sort. So, you know, they weren't worried what it was going to do, beat up a cop on the side of the road. <laughs> uh, I think they're more know. so worried about theft and drugs, because if you're yes. going to be impounding vehicles that are sealed, like I've unlocked yeah. many of sealed vehicles for police officers in my shop on the side of the road, uh, mm-hmm. even unlocking police cars. And it's just, it is what it yeah. is. We've been escorted to, to police compounds many times with because a vehicle was loaded with drugs or different things, right? So 100%. So I think the theft is a big one or drugs. Uh, not that, you know, violent crimes are any better, but I do wonder how many operators out in the province, you know, and I'm not saying that because you have a criminal record, you're, you're a bad person or, or a bad operator in the industry. I just wonder what the numbers actually are, right? Yeah. I've worked with plenty of guys that have criminal records that are great and amazing operators. And, you know, unfortunately, the criminal records sometimes can hold them back, which is a shame to see. But it's the reality of the world we live in, right? Yeah. I, like I said, the vulnerable persons police yeah. report, you should at least yeah. be able to pass that. Because that's I think that's a stickier one than the normal. Because there's a, a regular one, then a vulnerable persons. 
than a Canada wide for normally police contracts. The vulnerable per- mm. persons is one of the stricter ones. Is it? Hmm. I believe so because the other if vulnerable persons is also meant for when you're dealing with children, like any a lot of schools in the area. If you're going to volunteer to be a chaperone to go on the road, like the uh, field trips. Yeah. You need a vulnerable person's check because you are dealing with minors. So I believe it is actually a stricter one than you might think. Well, I, I just don't want people to see people driving tow trucks out of st- steal money from their grandparents before type thing while they're in a home, right? Mm-hmm. If you're going to steal money from your own family, what are you going to do to a Go grandmother broken down? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And that's up to companies to possibly run their own ahead of time, right? Yeah. Every driver that you have out there is representing your company it's up to you to weed them out and yeah we're, we're the odd one's gonna get through but you gotta weed them out and go yeah. so on behalf of myself and g i think that's about it for us and time as i see your little smooth hand gesture you're trying to hide that was very very Thanks. smooth i know you because don't have a timer in front of you i normally have a timer um we try and keep them you know we try not to run too far over time we might have today i have no idea but uh, from another undisclosed location, um, you know, thank you guys for coming out. If you want to leave us any comments, concerns, questions, answer any of the questions we asked on today's show, you can email us at the towing life at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at the towing life podcast or visit the website www.towinglife.ca. If you want to vote, don't forget to check out towinglife.ca slash poll. The poll will end the day this episode comes out on Tuesday. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that follow and subscribe either on YouTube or Apple Music or Spotify or wherever you're listening so you get notified when the new episodes drop every Tuesday morning. They got to go in the middle of the night so they can auto-download to your phone be ready to go for the truck that day. So don't forget to vote. See who's going to take a show off. G, you got anything to add to that? Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you to Plain Guy's dog for being quiet throughout this whole episode. Um, that was nice. Didn't get rudely interrupted. And with that said, guys, we will see you next time. Take care. Bye for now.